um, to share with you some examples of some of the complications we've seen and, and sort of outline sort of the time course following transplant, lung transplant, and what are the typical things we should be thinking about given how far away the patient is from their surgical date. And so I think to begin, it's important to recognize some of the complications that we see in the immediate post-operative period, and I'm going to show you some examples of these. Uh, the first of which is primary graft dysfunction, or another word for that is ischemia reperfusion injury. Um, we always think about in the immediate post-operative period a very fragile anastomosis, and we worry about anastomotic dehiscence during this time period. By far the most common um, post-operative uh, complication is infection, and I'm going to share that with you, and it's definitely going to be something I hope that you take away uh, from this, is that the thing that we fear the most is infection. Most people die of infection in the, in most Im in the immediate post-operative period. Uh, we do see commonly pleural space fluid collections, and I'm going to share with you some problems we've seen with these, and then finally talk about acute rejection. Uh, so just to begin, uh, this is a case of, of an immediate post-operative lung, lung complication, and as you can see here, this could be ARDS, it's not. You can see all the tubes and wires and diffuse bilateral infiltrate. And what this is an example of, or meant to be an example of, is hyperacute rejection. Fortunately, this is something that we rarely see. Um, it's seen generally either in the operating room or immediately following the surgery. Um, it's an antibody-mediated problem, and it's, it happens because of preformed antibody to the donor lung. Um, and so these are ABO, sometimes ABO group incompatibility rejections. Um, they tend to occur much more commonly in people who are highly sensitized, so those individuals who have high panel reactive antibodies. Um, and if you remember, in lung transplant, we really don't do typically matching of any HLA typing from donor to recipient unless we have somebody who is highly sensitized. And if they're highly sensitized, we try to do paper cross-matching, so we exclude donors that they're sensitized to. Uh, but I think this hyperacute rejection phenomenon is happening predominantly in those, um, those, those individuals who have very high PRAs or high antibodies, and we're not able to detect all of those antibodies, and so when we put an organ into them, they can have immediate rejection. Um, the sort of thought process of this is that you need to be able to recognize it very, very quickly. The treatment for this is immediate plasmapheresis followed by IVIG, and I think the quicker you do it, the more likely you are to be successful. Um, the other very common problem we will find will be primary graft dysfunction, and you'll notice this is the same x-ray I showed you for hyperacute rejection because you really in the immediate post-operative period, it's kind of hard to differentiate the two. But primary graft dysfunction is a major source of morbidity and even mortality early after lung transplant. It can occur in up to 10 to 20 percent of individuals. It pre presents very similar to ARDS, uh, or acute lung injury, and that it has bilateral uh, lung infiltrates and we have difficulty oxygenating, and it is a non-cardiogenic problem. There is a grading system that we use for primary graft dysfunction depending on the degree of abnormality of oxygenation with obviously grade three being the most severe. And so now just to turn a little bit to why people die, which I think is important to recognize. And so when we look at the first 30 days after lung transplant, by far one of the most common reasons why we have mortality is from primary graft failure. But you'll see the other thing that we deal with is infection. And so with these two, it makes up more than half of the deaths we see in the first 30 days. And that's why we'll have such a low index of putting people back on antibiotics because infection is sort of, can be one of the major problems that we can actually prevent in the first 30 days. And then if we look at where we are within the first year, you'll see still infection is a major problem in the first year. And even though patients are fearful of rejection and healthcare providers are fearful of acute rejection, you see that even uh, along the long-term basis of acute rejection, it's really not responsible for mortality. And that's the thing I think is a great teaching point is that people do not die of acute, inf of acute rejection. 
they die of infection. And so when we're th approaching um, acute rejection, we want to be very, very careful that we're not dealing with coexisting infections that should be treated because that's when we'll see people rapidly progress and end up on a ventilator and, and losing their graft. Um, when we look at other causes within the first um, 30 days, we have, um, still we have graft dysfunction. Uh, we see CMV, although in the era now of valcite and oral agents and prophylaxis, rarely is this something that causes people to die. Um, and we also see a very rare incidence of obliterative bronchiolitis within the first year causing death. When we look over one year, you're going to see much more obliterative bronchiolitis, and as we go along, this becomes the number one limiter of long-term survival um, after lung transplant. So this kind of highlights the same thing that that graph does, and that I'll bring your attention again to the fact that most people in the first 30 days, and certainly in the first year, uh, the mortality is associated with infection and not with acute rejection and that we see as time goes on a higher incidence of bronchiolitis or obliterative bronchiolitis limiting long-term survival. So let's talk a little bit and focus on the infectious complications. Uh, we see a lot of bacterial infection. Uh, we're going to talk about fungal infections, mycobacterial infections, which tend to be atypical, uh, viral infections, and then um, some of the prophylactic uh, treatments that we have to prevent infection. So just to begin, bacterial infection um, results in half of the death that we see. It is the most common early infection, and its risk is highest in the first six months. If we think about the donors we have, they're all coming off of ventilators. Most of them have had aspiration events, um, and they're all coming out of the ICU. So what we see are gram negatives, particularly Pseudomonas, but also MRSA, and that will help us to guide what the antibiotics we should use in the immediate postoperative period. So we always give something that's going to cover for Pseudomonas, and we always cover for MRSA in the immediate postoperative period. As it turns out, interestingly, Legionella is very, very uncommon, and we don't think about that as something that we routinely need to be prophylaxing for in our immediate postoperative period. Um, so next, CMV, and CMV is something that as you rotate on the transplant service, I'm sure you're all going to see. We have one case right now of CMV pneumonitis over on F2. Um, CMV and lung transplant is unique. So unlike other organs that rarely see CMV, the lungs are really very, very susceptible to this infection. And before we had prophylaxis, um, because we didn't have valcite 10 years ago, we only had gancyclovir. We found that at least half of our patients at some point in the first year would develop CMV, and many people lost their life to this. We know that the risk is higher in those individuals that are primary mismatches, and if you remember, those are the individuals who are not seeing CMV before transplant, but yet their donor is positive. So they have no innate immunity and no ability to have immunity as time goes on because we've immunosuppressed them. And those people will have a lifelong risk, not just within the first six months or year, but a lifelong risk of developing both CMV in their lung and in their GI tract. We have seen marked improvement with CMV disease due to our prophylactic regimens. And here we treat primary mismatch individuals for one year with valcite. Um, and if you're a secondary mismatch, you'll get six months of valcite, and that has dramatically reduced infection rates and disease. Uh, we also have a great marker for CMV, and that is that we can follow CMV quantitative le levels in the bloodstream. Um, and this has been a great thing because we can take people off of valcite, and as their quantitative amounts go up, we can put them back on. With the caveat that I think everybody needs to understand, and we have this individual right now that's a very good example, and that the levels of CMV in the bloodstream do not correlate with invasive disease. So we can have people with CMV um, ultra quantitative levels in their bloodstream of 50 or 60,000 and no organ involvement, and we can have the individual on F2 with CMV loaded throughout her biopsy in her lung and her CMV ultra quantis 1,000. So one is not a surrogate marker for the other, unfortunately. 
Um, so we always look at that donor recipient status and we prophylact people with either IV gancyclovir initially until they can swallow and then once they can swallow and their GI tract is working, they'll take uh, valgancyclovir orally for six months or one year if they're a mis primary mismatch. And so some examples of, of CMV include these uh, next, through, next few pathology slides. And we see this really large nuclei. Um, and typically we think of the nuclei as completely filling the cytoplasm and it's been described as an owl's eye um, cell. And this is an example of a case. So this is a 52 year old female who underwent um, bilateral lung transplant for pulmonary fibrosis. She came in with nondescript coughs and mild shortness of breath and diarrhea, which sometimes can be some clue. Um, and her CT sh scan showed what I typically see with CMV, and this is these ground glass opacities that you can all see bilaterally, particularly evident here. Um, and so how would we know that this is CMV? We would not. We have to go on to do a bronchoscopy and biopsy the patient to know. And this is her actual biopsy, and you can see the arrow pointing to these owl's eyes, the typical CMV cell that we see. Um, with biopsy and CMV. So fungal infections. So this is uh, somewhat unique to lung transplant and like other solid organ transplants in that we worry and fear uh, the fungal infection of aspergillus. Um, and the aspergillus after lung transplant can manifest itself in many ways. It can cause ulcerative bronchitis or tracheitis. It can cause pneumonia, invasive uh, aspergillus pneumonia. It can disseminate. Um, and some cases of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis have been reported. I've never seen that. So we prophylax for this infection, and we typically like to use aerosolized amphotericin, so we're prophylaxing the airway directly as opposed to oral voriconazole. Both, both treatments have been shown to be fairly equivalent in terms of outcomes and um, preventing aspergillus. However, we do know that with oral voriconazole, we run into a lot of toxicity problems, a lot of liver toxicity, and then we go down this path of trying to figure out if they have gallbladder disease or what's causing their, their uh, liver disease. And so we at our center use aerosolized uh, amphotericin unless for some reason the patient's not able to have it from an insurance standpoint. Other rarer things depend on the demographics of where you live. Of course, histoplasma can be a problem. Um, we have not seen very much Canada as a problem post-transplant except for in individuals who are in the ICU, on TPN, multiple lines, the same type of patient that you would think would be risk, at risk of fungemia. But typically, Canada in the airway is considered sort of a, um, not a contaminant, but not something that needs aggressive treatment after a lung transplant if the patient's otherwise clinically doing well. This is an example of one of our patients who has a very typical finding for invasive aspergillus. And as you can see, she has this rounded mass-like area, actually bilaterally with this inflammatory looking area here. Typically, aspergillus is described on the CAT scan as having this halo around it, or this sort of shaggy border to it. And then she was put on or oral voriconazole after a bronchoscopy, and her bronchoscopy revealing aspergillus, and this is her CAT scan one month after taking voriconazole. And typically, we can see this in the sputum, we can see this in the BAL, but the classic finding are these right angle hyphae that we see with aspergillus. There's another example of aspergillus in an airway. So this is the ast anastomosis after the individual is treated. This was at bronchoscopy and this pulled out showed aspergillus. Okay, so here's another case of a 62-year-old female who uh, was transplanted here with a double lung for pulmonary fibrosis. She came in complaining of three weeks of increasing, actually left upper quadrant pain, some shortness of breath and cough, and a low-grade fever. So 
You can all see right here, there's a mass-like opacity, not a very regular border, kind of shaggy in the lower lobe. So the question is, what is this? And we can get lots of answers. We could think it's pneumonia, or maybe it's nocardia, or aspergillus, or other things, cancer, could it be? And I think that the, the teaching point for this is, is that we don't know what this is until we go on to bronchoscopy. So the differential is so wide in immunosuppressed patients. And this was actually what was seen uh, on the bronchoscopy. So any ideas on what this is? Here were our choices. <laughs> So this was no cardia. And, uh, and so this is the typical uh, silver stain with these beaded organisms, the long chains, kind of like a necklace it's supposed to look like. And, and this is no cardia in one of our patients. So this is another girl. She's 24. She was transplanted actually um, in Pitts Pittsburgh. Uh, 14 years post bilateral lung transplant. She had her transplant for pulmonary hypertension. She came to us with a fever, cough, rhinorrhea, shortness of breath, and a lot of muscle ache, and she had just come back from Las Vegas. This was during flu season, and we swabbed her nose, and she grew influenza. Um, and I think it brings us to the idea that our transplant patients are particularly susceptible to influenza. They should all be vaccinated, very important. Uh, only 50% of transplant patients will mount a response to flu vaccine, but they should all be vaccinated. This is another example of something that we, we see a lot of pleural effusions after transplant, and the reason for that is that um, we and the, the, the kind of hookups are three. There are blood supply and two, and two blood supplies in an airway without any hookup of lymphatics or innervation. And so pleural effusions are very common. And uh, so whenever we have sort of a, a pleural effusion, we always want to tap it. And we not only want to tap it to give the lung maximal volume so that we don't end up with a compressive atelectatic lung that then won't work, but we also want to tap it because we want to make sure we're excluding infections because weird infections can happen. This was a 66-year-old male who had struggled after his transplant, uh, really failing to thrive. He continued to lose weight. He had a lot of GI issues and um, had increasing dyspnea with this pleural effusion that you can see on CAT scan. And when we tap this effusion multiple times, finally he was identified as having mycobacterium abscessus which he actually had pre-transplant. And this is the type of a mycobacterium following transplant that's known to be the most aggressive in producing pleural disease. It's pretty well written about in the literature is a very high risk type of a transplant when you're transplanting somebody with abscessus and you need to have a really clear kind of idea that they, this can cause recurrent pleural effusions. He actually died from this. It is a relative contraindication to transplant. Many centers will still transplant this. Men, most centers would now feel that they should be treated pre-transplant to see if you can eradicate the organism, which you may not be successful in because particularly in, in individuals with such diseased lungs, we can't really get rid of it, maybe to suppress the amount of it. So, so I wanted to put this slide in to just bring your attention to the fact that You'll see our patients coming in and out of the hospital pretty frequently, and you can see that only 40% of people in the first year stay out of the hospital after their initial discharge. So most people get hospitalized, and again, most people get hospitalized for acute infections. So that's the most common thing that we, we readmit people with. I'd like to talk about some non-infectious complications, particularly obliterative bronchiolitis. Uh, we're going to talk uh, a bit about um, some of the GI side effects that we see, some toxicities that we see with medications. We'll talk about PTLD and some airway problems. And so I think just to begin, when we talk about acute rejection, it's very common. About 30% of people will have acute rejection in the first year. And of those people that have rejection, it's more likely to occur in the younger aged individuals, particularly individuals, those tend to be the individuals that have cystic fibrosis. Uh, 
There's really no difference between males and females in terms of the risk for rejection. So some of the factors and why we have as an organ a higher risk of, uh, of rejection as opposed to other organs are that you know, with each breath you take, your lungs are constantly exposed to the environment. Um, we have the largest organ with the most immune tissue that's being transplanted, and so that probably has another role in why we see so much rejection. We know well that rejection is a T-cell mediated event for the majority of people who have it, um, and it's graded based on the amount of perivascular uh, lymphocytes we see at a given power of microscope. The symptoms of acute rejection are very nonspecific, so there's nothing that I can tell you that tells me when I see the patient in the clinic that they have acute rejection. Um, we do suspect it when their FEV1 in isolation is going down, so this is an obstructive problem. Um, sometimes they will have a change in the x-ray. The most common x-ray with acute rejection is a normal x-ray, so usually they don't have a change. But if they do, they may have nothing more than a simple, small, bilateral, new, pleural effusion that's small. The only way to diagnose this is by biopsy. And that also helps us to exclude infection, which is the common thing that we're trying to debate what the patient has. As I said before, patients don't die of acute rejection. They die of chronic rejection. And I think one of the important factors about acute rejection is that it is the most common risk factor for cro chronic rejection. So if you have to pick out which is the most likely thing to result in or to be a link to chronic rejection, it's going to be acute rejection. So that's why we try to treat this whenever we see it. This is an example of a 59-year-old who had a bilateral lung transplant uh, for pulmonary fibrosis a month ago. He came in with or actually was still in the hospital, had increasing shortness of breath and some low-grade fever and a dry, non-productive cough. And again, a very non-specific CAT scan that's maybe not showing quite as well, but there's some ground glass opacity here, here. You see fluid in the fissure, very common, and probably a little bit more consolidated area right there. So again, what's the diagnosis? And the answer is we don't know until we do the biopsy, and that's why we biopsy people so early. Um, and this did turn out to be acute rejection. So again, the signs are nonspecific. This chest, the chest x-ray is usually unremarkable. The FEV1 can happen, both drop can happen with infection and rejection. And the diagnosis of acute rejection always requires a transbronchial biopsy. Um, we at our center, unlike all centers, we do a surveillance schedule. So if the patient's feeling well, we do a biopsy the first year every three months, and then the second year we do it every six months. Um, so we know that 66% of centers do surveillance. The other centers that do not do surveillance instead wait for clinical symptoms or a decline in FEV1. A good study out of Pittsburgh showed comparing centers that have surveillance and those that don't, that they have equal numbers of biopsies done. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's not like you're getting away from doing biopsies. Likely if you're not surveying patients, your threshold to do a transbronchial biopsy is a lot lower than ours would be having surveil of surveillance schedule. So I'm going to show you some pathology of acute rejection, and this should be pretty easy to see. This is a vessel and these are lymphocytes surrounding the vessel. The degree of rejection is based on what power ma uh, magnification you need to use to see this. The higher power that you need to see this, the lower the grade of rejection. Another example, very easily seen, a lot of lymphocytes cuffing the vessel. So here are some more examples. So we can see this is the vessel, this pink wall. It has muscle in it, and these are lymphocytes cuffing it. Another example, it's showing up better on my screen, of a vessel right here and a lot of lymphocytes. So re acute rejections, almost always treatable. Probably 90 to 95% of cases will respond to our treatment, which is to give solumedrol. We give it a gram a day for three days in a row, followed by augmented immunosuppression. Uh, 
Very rarely do we go on, and we always follow that up with another biopsy, very rarely do we have to go on and use other types of immune suppression, but one thing we do consider is giving thymoglobulin if they continue to have uh, high-grade acute rejection. We always look carefully at why they got it. Were their um, drug levels too low? We maximize their drug level. Probably as commonly as that is, are they compliant with their medication? Are they feeling so well that now they're not, they're skipping doses or missing doses, which is a very, very common thing. Here's an example of a mild rejection that we saw, and you can see the very subtle blunting of the costophrenic angle, and you can see what happens after we get the prednisone burst and taper for A1 rejection that resolves. Um, so that was a T-cell mediated uh, problem that we saw in the biopsy, and I'm going to tell you about another type of now recognized rejection, and this was uh, the case in a 60-year-old who was a year and a half after his bilateral transplant for emphysema. He came in with a two-week history of cough and shortness of breath and a low-grade fever and a marked decline in his FEV1. Um, he was short of breath and he was acutely ill and he went on to have a transbronchial lung biopsy uh, that, that actually identified RSV. His blood was checked for donor antibodies and he had a new donor specific antibody and on his biopsy he was felt to have capillaritis. And this is an example of capillaritis um, and when we see this we think about antibody deposition around the capillary bed with a complement mediated cascade that's response that's that's driven by an antibody deposition in the lung. This type of of humoral rejection or antibody mediated rejection has been well recognized within the kidney group and less well recognized within the lung transplant group and probably just described over at least the last decade. So we know that this is a result of uh, antibodies directed towards the donor that were not present prior to the transplant. Um, and we know that there's a strong component of both complement and non-complemented, complement mediated damage to the lung. The diagnosis is difficult and that we have to look at the clinical course. So do they have graft dysfunction? Do they have a donor specific antibody in their bloodstream? And then on biopsy, do we find some finding of graft dysfunction. This is unlike T cell mediated rejection where we have to see it on the biopsy. This, the findings of humoral rejection are somewhat subtle. They're not always agreed upon. There is a stain that looks for antibody deposition. It's called a C4D stain. It's very nonspecific, but when we see it, it does help us to have a higher index of suspicion. Um, so we really need to have like the whole scenario to be able to call this. The treatment for this is to try to get rid of the preformed antibody. So we use IVIG, which we know blocks antibodies. We use plasmapheresis, and then we follow this treatment with usually a dose of rituximab, which depletes B cells, which make the antibodies. So this is an example of this C4D stain, and this is the kidney control. This just gives you kind of the color. And what we look for are, this is a cap, this is a vessel and we look for a very fine thread of, of this staining, which is pretty evident here and here, and in real life it doesn't usually ever look like this. It's always much more vague. So unlike acute rejection, we're going to talk about chronic rejection, which is a major problem that people die from after a lung transplant, and we find it five years. The literature varies depending on how you define this, but probably more than half of individuals at five years will have evidence of obliterative bronchiolitis. The symptoms for this are usually slowly progressive and can just be mild shortness of breath, some cough, and occasional wheezing. Um, on pathology, we see these are bronch there's bronchial uh, inflammation and narrowing of the lumen of the airway. This is, a, this is a disease that is hard to detect on transbronchial biopsies. Probably only 20% of people when they're biopsied will, that have OB will ha have it found on transbronchial biopsies. So we grade this based on stages of loss of FEV1. So we look at your best FEV1, 
and what your FEV1 is at a given date, and if it's, you know, um, between 66 and 80 percent of the best, it's considered stage one boss, and if it's, and you can see the categories here. Um, but I think the thing also to recognize with this is that this is a very, very common thing. And when we look at 15 years out from transplant, um, about 80% of people will have evidence of graft loss or declining FEV1. So why do people get this? There are some things that are strongly associated, and the most commonly associated thing is acute rejection. So if we have an individual that has more than three episodes of acute rejection in the first year following transplant at five years, they will universally have evidence of OB. We don't know that one causes the other, but certainly they're associated with one another. Another strong associator is CMV pneumonitis. So when you have had invasive CMV in your lung, you are at higher risk to develop obliterative bronchiolitis. And then finally, well recognized and described now are individuals who have um, significant acid reflux, and those individuals also have a high incidence of uh, obliterative bronchiolitis. Um, the other thing to recognize is that it, it can begin early after transplant. So I, we used to really think about this as something in long-term survivors. But, you know, we have seen this, especially in people who have um, not made it through the first year, they can have evidence of obliterative bronchiolitis. This is the pathology of OB, and you can see the dotted line is where the airway used to be, and this is the, the actual airway actually being closed down by fibrotic fo focus. Another example with a trichrome stain of an airway. Here's another airway and you can see you can't even really see the lumen of this airway because it's so fibrotic at this point. This tends to be an irreversible problem wherever we find this disease. Sometimes we can do things that I'm going to talk about to stabilize it, but unlike acute rejection, we usually don't restore lung function once they've developed obliterative bronchiolitis. So we've tried a lot of things and, and not much does really show to work. If we augment their immunosuppression, we need to do it very carefully because again, infections then are really common. Um, other things that have been um, certainly described include um, switching from cell sept to immuran or switching around their immunosuppression, which I think our experience has been does work for some people. Photophoresis is being done to, to inactivate T cells. Um, we consider individuals that have an obliterative bronchiolitis as always needing to have reflux studies done, and then if they have reflux that's significant based on their Demestri score, we'll consider a Nissan fundal plication. Everyone should be put on azithromycin. Good study shows that this does uh, slow the decline of lung function in individuals, and probably certainly not from its antimicrobial basis, but based on the fact that it's an anti-inflammatory also. So you'll see people on both Bactrim Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and azithromycin Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then finally, retransplantation is something we strongly consider in individuals who have lost graft function from obliterative bronchiolitis. So this is a 58-year-old um, patient who um, had emphysema and had a progressive um, increase in dyspnea. We had a biopsy that ruled out acute rejection and infection was ruled out. And it's meant to show sort of what is seen with obliterative bronchiolitis, and that is that these people uh, end up having a lot of air trapping. And I'm sure it's probably not projecting, but the CT scan often shows this mosaic attenuation of air trapping within the lung. So we get inspiratory and expiratory views, and we see this mosaic pattern, and that's a very strong clue that they've developed if their FEV1 has declined obliterative bronchiolitis. So another common problem that we see are cancers following transplant. And as we recognize more and more about the mechanisms of cancer, we see that everybody depends on their immune system in order to prevent cancer. And so when we look in long-term survivors following transplant, we see that about, um, in 10-year survivors, about 28% of them will have some type of a malignancy. 
with clearly uh, dermal cancer being the most uh, prevalent, but we also see uh, lymphomas in these individuals, which are obviously much more serious than dermal cancers are. Um, and this just highlights again that, that uh, lymphoma, other than skin cancer, is the most common type of uh, cancer. So the lymphoma is called PTLD, which is post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease. It can be monoclonal or polyclonal. It is definitively related to infection with EBV virus. It is seen most commonly in people who are EBV primary mismatches. Again, the same thing with CMV. So somebody who's never seen EBV and you give them an organ that has had EBV virus, those are the high risks for PTLD. The most common way that this presents is a nodule or a mass in the graft. Um, and then the second most common place that this can present is in the GI tract. The treatment for this is, we've, we've fortunately not had a lot of um, experience with this. The treatment is described as reducing immunosuppression and many people will get better from it. We've not had that experience. And that our patients who have had this have um, had to go on to not only rituximab therapy, but even chemotherapy, which is obviously very difficult in somebody who's uh, on immunosuppression. Oops, sorry. So this is another example of one of our patients, and I think sort of a good teaching point for the Bronx suite, and this is the x-ray here, and this is in January of 2008. He underwent a left single lung transplant for emphysema. And in October, he comes to clinic with uh, asymptomatic with an x-ray that looks like this. And we can see that he's collapsed his right upper lobe. And on bronchoscopy was found to have uh, a, non, a lung cancer obstructing his bronchus in his native lung. So I think this is a, and under, actually underwent a uh, pneumonectomy. He's still alive and well, and I'm sure you guys all take care of him on F2 because he comes in frequently, but not related to this. Um, and so this is a good example of when we bronch patients for transplant that have single lungs, always looking at their native lung and doing an airway exam because these people are at high risk for lung cancer. Um, and, you know, the risk factor for his transplant and emphysema was his smoking, and I'm sure that's why he developed that uh, lung cancer. Uh, so other morbidities that are very commonly seen, um, I think the first is hypertension, and we'll see that half of people at one year will be on multiple blood pressure medications. And by five years, uh, um, like 82% of people have very significant uh, hard to control hypertension. Renal dysfunction is very common and we see that when we start looking at people who have creatinines over two and a half, within five years it's 15 percent. Um, high cholesterol is also common and as is diabetes. Renal function is problematic in that about 10 percent of people at 10 years will be on dialysis following lung transplant. I think we're getting better and I think this will be something that we're going to impact, but at least at this point in time, the majority uh, of patients who end up at 10 years and on dialysis have very poor outcomes. And so when we look at trying to keep somebody immunosuppressed on chronic dialysis, it's really problematic. Oftentimes we'll now be using rapamycin as opposed to calcineuric drugs. The major risk factor for this is long-term calcineuric drug therapy. And then finally, I just wanted to say some words about airway stenosis or anastomotic strictures. Um, and this is described in about 15% of lung transplants, so it's not uncommon. You can see this is uh, somebody who, after his transplant, had a persistent pseudomonal anastomotic infection, and one of the risk factors for anastomotic stricture is an infection of the anastomosis. Um, and this is an example of a chest x-ray with a classic middle lobe collapse. And this is a stent that's put across the right main stem but had occlusion of his right main bronchus here, or right, uh, right middle lobe, excuse me.
This is another individual who we transplanted. Um, I'm sure many of you took care of him. He had a bilateral transplant for pulmonary fibrosis. And we couldn't figure out why he was having these peripheral airway stenosis. This is his uh, left upper low bronchus that you see become slit-like and eventually we didn't see anymore. And after multiple biopsies, we found that he had herpetic infection of his airway. He was a, a CMV negative negative patient, so wasn't getting any prophylaxis and um, was HSV positive and that's, this is the result of HSV in his airway. Since this point in time, we've put everybody on, that's a, on life, he took lifelong acyclovir, but since this we've put everybody who's CMV negative negative on acyclovir as prophylaxis the first six months. Everybody, as you know from taking care of them, goes home with a handheld spirometer and at home they're measuring their FEV1. If there's more than 10% change, they call us. This is probably one of the most sensitive measures of something going wrong after transplant. And here's an example of uh, a fungal disease of the anastomosis. And once it's cleared up with therapy, you can see there is still narrowing. So another anastomotic complication, it's treated with a balloon dilation. So I'm going to conclude with this slide, which is the good news. So I show you all of these complications, but we follow eight, uh, individuals after transplant and we keep track of how well are you doing. And so we all see these cases that are in the hospital who are not doing well or haven't left. But I think that the very good news about lung transplant is the patients who are home that we don't frequently see in the hospital, which fortunately is the majority of living patients. And so when we survey, survey people, and this is based on a survey now of, um, this was like over 10,000 individuals, and we, they asked, do you have any activity limitations after your transplant? And at one year and at five years, it's you know, greater than 80% of people who say they have no functional limitation to anything they want to do after lung transplant. So I think when it works, it works really well, and people get back to productive lives. Um, but there certainly are a lot of complications to be aware of. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions and any comment. Yes. Right. So we're talking about, we talked about obliterative bronchiolitis, but we know and have recognized and has been defined over the last several years that there's another type of chronic rejection that happens. And it's a restrictive phenomenon that looks more upper lobe, fibrotic. It can have a lot of pleural-based abnormality to it. Um, it tends to be much more rapidly progressive than obliterative bronchiolitis is. It really does not respond well to immunosuppression augmentation, we know that. Um, and its treatment is early retransplantation. Why it happens, again, we're not sure. We don't know why obliterative bronchiolitis happens. We have these things that are associated. We do feel that GERD is probably one mechanism. Um, and why restrictive allograft syndrome happens, we don't know. Yes? I've got two questions. And, uh, the patient actually from the whole meal to the class, but the bronchiolitis, which kind of makes sense for them because you just couldn't do bone meal, but the lung is not formed for them. But the problems I run into with that with these bone meal trips from people, number one, they're less singular, but people want it. So, if you can comment on what the evidence really is for that, for that rejection, or is it going to kind of do both together? Um, the second thing they'd love to do is, oh my gosh, is they really back off of their immunosuppressive therapy down the road pretty quickly, so they're like about half of we use. And so, if you also comment on the evidence for Pushing it back up again, if I get up and cross an into it, I know it can. If you get more than this, because it's very easy to slow down the ability of bronchiolitis. So singular and... Right. Uh, so even singular in, in lung transplant chronic rejection is used without a lot of good evidence that I'm aware of. Um, there certainly are a set of patients that we see with obliterative bronchiolitis who have a s pretty significant component of wheezing. And, you know, we we've tried giving them singular, and for some people it helps. Um, 
In terms of the level of immunosuppression and how we should do that, there have been no good studies, and they actually I know uh, sort of a lot of people will talk about the risks of augmenting, giving people like thymoglobulin, which we used to do when they developed chronic rejection, and I think that's thought of as, as not in favor and not something that we would consider at this point. However, what we do do is we make sure that their prograph levels aren't running at two or three or four. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not sure the answer to that. I, we certainly wouldn't back down on immunosuppression when they're facing OB. Um, yeah, and we don't generally, like, we wouldn't give people solumedrol for that anymore. We wouldn't give them thymo or anything like that. Yes? Yeah. Read somewhere that CF patient is said to be better than ICF patient. Is that difference mainly because we CF patients are younger in general when we get them? Um, I think you can't exclude that. I mean, certainly we know even when you look at people who, it's hard to like tease out that age is not a big factor with that. Uh, we know younger individuals have more acute rejection. Um, <coughs> And so I'm not sure, but definitely the CF group has a higher survival and the PH group has a worse survival. And that is even when we look at um, accounting for the 30-day mortality or once you would think the ventricle has remodeled. In the last maybe, let's say, five years, are we better in general with our five-year survival or are we about to So when we look at since LAS has taken effect now almost 10 years, um, this, the one-year survival is not any different. What is different is the acuity of patients that we're transplanting. So I think that we would feel that we do, a, we do better in transplanting than we did five years ago because we're transplanting individuals who are far sicker than we would have ever transplanted before LAS took effect. So, you know, we used to transplant the majority of patients walked in from home on two or three liters of oxygen before LAS, and now we're transplanting people because it was just a weight-based system. You got your name on the list and you waited. And in Michigan, you waited three years for a double lung transplant pretty uniformly unless there was something weird about your profile. And many people were transplanted, many people died waiting, or many people transplanted not a lot worse than they were three years before, but their name was up. So now I think the general consensus is that definitively we're transplanting people off ECMO, we're transplanting patients off ventilators in an ICU setting. Those patients wouldn't have survived to transplant before or if, they, if we found them at that point when they had waited the requisite time, we would have said, oh, you're too sick. So if you look at the overall survival, it's not different. Yeah. Right. Sure. So, you know, since LAS took effect, one of the main shifts is towards, or the major focus of LAS is to transplant people to improve survival. So we look for people who have less than ideally a year to live. Uh, without a transplant, and those are the people that we try to transplant because of the long-term survival. So I think that definitively the patients who are being transplanted now are being transplanted to improve survival. When you look at the LAS scores, roughly once your score is about 31, your survival benefit is zero. So you would live as long with the graft as you would with a transplanted lung. The average transplant score in this country is 38. And actually, I just looked at our average transplant score in the lab, when we did 26 lung transplants um, in 2015, our average transplant score was 62. So one of our messages to our group, I think, our transplant group, is that we're transplanting really, really sick people. And, and I think all centers sort of go through this. You analyze who you're transplanting, and then you look at outcomes, and. You know, fortunately, we've had really good outcomes, but we've had really long lengths of stay, which is all analyzed by insurance companies. So I think when you're transplanting somebody off of ECMO or off of, you know, uh, a situation where they're on, you know, high-flow nasal cannula in the ICU and they haven't walked for months, anything more than like a few steps around the unit, those are going to be difficult people to get home. <coughs> 
quickly. Okay, thank you.